Not to downplay the achievement of the monument, but it was really not that awesome. Seriously, you could only look at giant heads carved into the side of a mountain for so long. We drove across this country and through South Dakota for this? If I could give zero to this collection of American Fat Pants Ice Cream Zoo, I would. This is a disgrace to the park system. Don't go here. Stay in the hills or badlands instead. I do not think it is patriotic to face a mountain. Also, the surrounding towns are horrible. I'm pretty sure that the next gathering of the Juggalos is taking place around here somewhere. Not very good. Kind of scary in my opinion. My little sister cried. Do not bring kids to this thing. Despite the one-star Yelp reviews, this South Dakota monument attracts more than 2 million tourists per year. It became a sought-after movie backdrop by Alfred Hitchcock, which caused rumors and controversy with the National Park Service, and started off with a 14-year construction using nearly 400 men and women. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind Mount Rushmore. But first, a quick word from Hashtag Potter and Family, a great group of indie podcasters like me. What is the Potter and Family? Hey, this is Shane. That's not Shane. That's a robot set by the government. And that's Kenny from I'm now that I'm... a robot, too. From now that I'm older. More like now that I'm robots. This is Gabriel Russo from the Hollywood Scandals of Yesteryear podcast. This is Steve. From the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Nick from the Epic Film Guys podcast. This is Emily from The Story Behind. This is Adam from Everyone Has a Podcast. This is Sean Harrigan from the Cinescape podcast. We are you. Podcasters coming together in a community to help one another grow. So follow us on Twitter at Potter Family and use the hashtag Potter Family in your tweets and retweet other people who do the same. Potter Family, where great podcasts come home. In Black Hills National Forest, just north of Custer State Park, a New York lawyer named Charles E. Rushmore was inspecting mining claims and legal titles in South Dakota. In 1884, he asked Bill Chalice, a local guide, the name of a particular mountain. Chalice replied, It never had a name, but from now on we'll call it Rushmore. That mountain went from being known as Rushmore Peak to Rushmore Mountain, to Mount Rushmore. But Chalice was mistaken about the mountain never having a name. The Lakota Indians had called the mountain the Six Grandfathers, which was named for the earth, the sky, and the four directions. We're becoming more familiar with the fight the Indians have with government over disputed land now, with the protests at Standing Rock over the Dakota Pipeline. But before this, the carvings on Mount Rushmore became a symbol of the loss of their sacred lands, In the summer of 1970, members of the American Indian Movement began occupying the ledge above the president's head for about a month in protest of injustices suffered under the U.S. government, and the memorial is still a commonplace for these protests. Another variation of the naming of Mount Rushmore is more common around the Keystone, South Dakota area. This version revolves around Dave Swansea, a gold prospector who staked out a claim along Grizzly Creek. When he came across the rocky outcrop, he named it after the New York City lawyer Charles Rushmore. Dave Swansea went on to marry a newspaper reporter named Carrie Ingalls. And if that last name sounds familiar, it's because Carrie was the sister of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who wrote The Little House on the Prairie books. Swansea is buried in the Keystone Cemetery, the only cemetery in the world with a view of Mount Rushmore, and it's where many of the carvers who worked on Mount Rushmore are buried. South Dakota State Historian Doanne Robinson wanted to attract more tourists to the Black Hills area in the 1920s. He came up with an idea for a sculpture of historical heroes. Originally, he had suggested a Sioux chief named Red Cloud. But when Robinson contacted Danish-American sculptor Gutzon Borglum, Borglum suggested carving the faces of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, with the idea that they would attract more tourism than a Sioux Indian chief. He later added the ideas for Thomas Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt as a tribute to their contributions to the birth of democracy. 
Hence, let us place there, carved high as close to heaven as we can, the words of our leaders, their faces, to show posterity what manner of men they were. Then breathe a prayer that these records will endure until the wind and rain alone shall wear them away. A bill was later introduced to Congress in 1937, proposing that a carving of Susan B. Anthony's head be included in the monument. However, that fell through because federal funds could only be spent on the carvings that had already begun at that time. When Borglum visited the Black Hills in 1925, he chose Rushmore as the site for his sculpture, despite protests from the American Indians and environmentalists. But Robinson and government officials tirelessly raised the money for the project. Construction began in 1927. It was officiated by President Calvin Coolidge. When the first blast of dynamite took place, Coolidge designated two hundred and fifty thousand in federal funds for this project. It took fifteen years for construction of the faces on Mount Rushmore, and nearly four hundred men and women worked on it. They would work through the hot summers and cold winters, climbing seven hundred steps every morning just to punch in for a pay rate of eight dollars per day. Remember, this was the Depression, and work was difficult to come by. Those who worked on the mountain put aside their fear of heights for the chance to work on the memorial. Despite the dangerous conditions and extreme height of 500 feet, no lives were lost in the construction. However, because of the workers' resistance to wearing masks because of the heat and discomfort, many of them later succumbed to what was known as silicosis, which was caused by prolonged exposure to the silica dust. Borglum utilized new methods to blast through the rock, and 450,000 tons of rock were removed from Mount Rushmore, much of which still remains at the base of the mountain. 90% of the mountain was carved using dynamite. Workers known as powdermen would set specific sizes of dynamite to remove meticulously measured amounts of rock. After the dynamite removed all but three to six inches of the rock for a carving surface, workers would drill holes closely together so the granite could easily be removed by hand. This was known as honeycombing, and the result had such a cool look to it. Hoist operators would swindle passersby, who would offer to pay for the pieces of the honeycombed rock, thinking they were buying a rare souvenir. Unfortunately, Borglum died only a few months before the sculpture was completed. Mount Rushmore had been a staple of the big and small screens since it was completed in 1941. The monument caught the eye of director Alfred Hitchcock, and he started looking for the perfect movie in which to use it as a backdrop. He found that perfect movie. When he decided to use it in a chase scene in 1958's *North by Northwest*, the action thriller starring Cary Grant, Eva Marie Saint, and James Mason started a rift between the National Park Service, the Department of the Interior, South Dakota Senator Carl E. Munt, and Hitchcock, with the Park Service putting up concerns about potential desecration of the monument. Originally, MGM and the Park Service signed an agreement allowing permission for Hitchcock to film there, on the grounds that there were no scenes of violence filmed near or on the sculpture or the slope below. The agreement also prohibited violence to be filmed on a mock set depicting the monument. Hitchcock's location manager tried to assure officials that they would treat the monument with complete respect, and no characters would tread on the faces or heads of the sculpture. Before shooting, however, a reporter asked Hitchcock about the chase scene, to which Hitchcock handed him a napkin with the president's heads drawn on it and a dotted line showing the path of the chase. When a picture of the napkin was published, the Department of the Interior revoked Hitchcock's permit and prohibited the actors from filming in conjunction with either the real or mock-up faces. Hitchcock almost pulled the movie when he found out he couldn't shoot on the faces. But he still came to Rapid City and reassured the citizens. It's a good thing for the world to see the big monuments that we have. This is part of America. When they say we'll do something on Lincoln's nose, this is very bad. We wouldn't dream of it. 
In fact, it would defeat the purpose for which we are using Mount Rushmore in the film. In the end, Hitchcock agreed not to film any of the chase scenes at the real memorial. He shot them on a studio mock-up, or against still shots that acted as a backdrop. But when the movie was closer to the premiere, the press loved the use of Mount Rushmore for the scene, some even erroneously reporting Hitchcock had used the real monument for some of it, when in fact a life-size replica had been built in Culver City. When the Park Service and the Interior Department got wind of these claims, they wrote a heated letter to MGM President Joseph E. Vogel. But by that point, it was too little, too late. The misconception was already there, spread even more so by the press and controversy surrounding it. In the end, MGM was asked to remove the line in the movie credits stating, We gratefully acknowledge the cooperation of the United States Department of the Interior and the National Park Service in the actual filming of the scenes at Mount Rushmore National Memorial, South Dakota. Acting Interior Secretary Elmer F. Bennett warned MGM that any future permit applications to film in a national park would receive closer scrutiny, and even a bid in 1957 to use Mount Rushmore to stage a similar chase was rejected. But Hollywood has a way of getting around the government to get the scenes they want. Without giving away any spoilers, I'll just direct you to the movie Team America World Police. The one-star Yelp reviews were read by Adam and Brian from Everyone Has a Podcast and Porter from Porter's Podcast. The role of Bill Chalice was played by Rich Grimshaw, a forensic engineer from Cumming, Georgia. Brandon from the Basement Condition Podcast played Gutzon Borglum. And Podcast Rob from the Something Something Cast played Alfred Hitchcock. Information for this episode was sourced from History.com, NationalParksTraveler.com, rosyin.com, pbs.org, ghostandghouls.com, azquotes.com, the National Park Service, and Yelp. For these links and more, visit the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Twitter at storybehindpod, or subscribe on your podcatcher of choice so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.